American Handgunner Insider. Hey folks, Tom McHale with American Handgunner Magazine here again with another episode of American Handgunner Insider. And if you're especially observant, those of you watching the video version, you will see that we have a guest today. We have the, can I call you infamous? The infamous Jeremy Clow. He is our, <laughs> our uh, you know, I'm going to say you're our 1911 guy. I mean, I think, I, you know, I think your um, purpose in life is to one, be at gunsight and to tinker with 1911s. Is that pretty much it? I don't know how that pays, but, Fair you know, it does so. <laughs> so. I drink coffee. Good, good, good to have you here. So I thought it would be fun if we uh, shared, you wrote the cover story for the current issue of American Handgun right now. I think it's the one on the cover it says November, December issue, but it's out on the streets as we speak. Subscribers have it. You can get it on magazine racks everywhere. And uh, you have managed to scrounge up and find one absolutely beautiful gun made of rocks. Fair statement. Fair. Yes, sir. So I'll pull up uh, while we're talking for those of you watching the video version. I'll uh, pull up a couple of pictures so you can see what we're talking about. But uh, Jeremy found a a Colt Custom uh, pistol with some very special turquoise grips. And this thing is just absolutely gorgeous. If you don't like it, something is seriously wrong with you. So, Jeremy, where did you where did you find this? How did you come across this gun? I actually kind of started with the grips. I had a, a friend of mine who is one of those folk. We just give each other horrible ideas and in, in the best possible way. He uh, works the uh, law enforcement government agency space and had been involved in some work fighting the cartels and wanting to commemorate his service. He wanted to build a pistol patterned after uh, the cartel guns and he nicknamed the project the narco 11 and of course we went back and forth saying well what would a gun like this look like and so that led us both deep down this rabbit hole of looking at stuff that was well out of the normal mainstream i mean obviously there's going to be no g10 on that there's going to be no coco bolo you really want something's got some flash and some style and in the course of looking for just uniquely beautiful grips i stumbled across some of the stuff that santa fe stoneworks does and i I looked at them. I saw some of them in person at Blade Show in Atlanta, and I basically said, I got to do something with a set of grips like this. And so the grips were the goal, and the gun wasn't necessarily an afterthought, but the gun was a good way to really showcase their beauty. Yeah, I remember that when you and I were talking, boy, it's probably been months now, um, about this story. You said, I've got this set of grips that's just awesome. It's to die for. I have to do a story on it. And I'm, I'm sitting here thinking I didn't, and, and I'm a little slow sometimes, so I didn't appreciate the full picture of actually putting them on a gun. So I was trying to envision, <laughs> you know, we're going to do a story on a pair of grips. Okay. you <laughs> know, I'll have to trust you on this as we go. It's like the time Roy gave me an assignment on magazine pouches. You have to find a little bit more than that. <laughs> well, you did. Okay, so I didn't know this until just now when you said it, but does the the kind of narco angle explain the chambering of this gun a little bit? A little bit, yes, sir. The, the 38 Super has always been popular along the border because the 1911 was popular both in Texas and the U.S. side and in Mexico, but in Mexico, civilians could not own military calibers such as the 45 ACP, but they could own the 38 Super. And so not only was it popular with folks who lived over the border, it was popular with officers who worked the border because they could get ammo on the other side if they had to. Right, right. So interesting caliber cho choice too. I, I absolutely love the, um, well, I can't call 38 Super an oddball calendar, caliber, but it's, um, can we say out of the mainstream? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a 45 Fair. or in more modern 1911 designs or 2011 designs. It's not a nine millimeter. So, so there you go. So I think, so, so anyway, the grips are, are just, well, I think there's two things special about this gun. Let's hit on the grips first. I mean, you, these things are just absolutely phenomenal. It kind of reminds me of that uh, Japanese art form where um, they take broken porcelain and pottery and repair it you know, with gold uh, metal, you know, pinstriping to kind of uses the glue to put the pieces back together. Um, so help, help us understand a little bit about how these, how these grips work. 
you know, the with turquoise stone. I think I think that's called Kintsugi, and the idea is to appreciate the imperfect in daily life, which is a little bit different from what they did with it here. Uh, a lot of turquoise is naturally very soft, and it has to be stabilized before you can use it, and certainly before you could put it on something that's going to recoil. And so the, the Kingman Mine, which is probably the best known source of turquoise in, in, the, in America, if not the world, came up with a unique process to stabilize turquoise and not only to stabilize the stone itself, but to mix it with other stones. And then they flow in a liquid bronze that then kind of creates yeah. that spider web look and is best I can figure kind of the matrix that helps hold it all together. And that's what creates that, that spider webbing look. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And, and you know, following the progression of Santa Fe, uh, you know, what you, taught us all about with this uh, this feature piece is um, the progression the company took from doing kind of non-jewelry items with turquoise and you know into into things that could just be made to look nice everyday items and uh, one of the th one of the directions that got us where we are today with the 1911 grips was knives yes that was one of the places they got started as the the jewelry market in Santa Fe was very crowded at the time the Wordles got into it. Bill Wordle, the founder of the business, when he started. And he realized that it was going to be really hard to find a profitable seat at the table. And so he took the idea mm -hmm. of using jewelry techniques and materials and applying them to other things where, where they weren't really traditionally used. So there wouldn't be as much competition. And knives is one of the first places. Say, this is one of theirs that I'm holding up here. They found ways to put precious stones on knife handles and still make them usable and tough enough to actually use every day and enough that they could safely warrant it and tell you, Hey, this isn't just an art item. It's something pretty right. you can carry around with you use every day. Yeah. I imagine they learned a few things about uh, durability and turquoise starting with the knife project, right? I would think so. I would think so. And it's something I didn't realize is I've always thought of turquoise as being a blue stone but it goes through a number of different color gradations. And from the Kingman mine in particular, the color depends on where in the mountain they get the turquoise from. So that, that pair that I put on that gun, it was very, very blue, but this is another pair from Kingman. This much more of a greenish color. Oh yeah. And they also have a Mojave green and you can see some of the, uh, the bronze matrix in this a little bit better. That's almost That's a little bit jade like in, in tone. It is. I'd never thought of turquoise as being this color, but it can be. I, I'd never seen that either. That's fine. Oh, that's fantastic. So, um, well, maybe in the future we'll see another gun uh, that is finished appropriately for one of those sets that you just held up, right? Yes. One hopes. <laughs> cool. So, so uh, Santa Fe just did a bang up job on this. Boy, couldn't ask for a, a more beautiful gun for for the cover feature and in, in this issue. So, there is another element though that kind of stands out on this one, and that is the polish. And I, just a little bit of inside dope. Um, <clears throat> our professional photographer Rob Jones, the Image Smith, this is a company name, does all our cover spreads, and and a matter of fact, he does the knife features too. Uh, written by Pat Covert, and uh, I I knew this one was going to give him fits when he went to uh, to photograph it because you know you start putting lights up in the studio and you get glare and reflection and you see yourself in the gun while you're trying to take pictures and uh, I you know I'm not a photographer so I couldn't relay the the detailed settings but he had to just crank all the way down on virtually everything you know to even get photos of this gun it is is literally so bright and shiny so. To tell us a little bit about the the polish on this guy that's that's something you don't think about at first is if you've got a mirror polish when you try to photograph that it's like trying to photograph a mirror and you wind up photographing what's on the other side of the gun and the reflection as much as you do the gun itself you know polishing really is an art form and it's hard to describe what's involved in getting that kind of finish because a, a lot of polished guns if you look at them closely still have deep scratches in the surface that they're not immediately mm -hmm. evident, but if you know what to look for, it's not really a full, full mirror polish and really doing a hand polished job of removing all the scratches of the previous grid and getting a gun truly that shiny really is about a 40 hour job. And 
there's a couple of ways I know that that's a 40 hour job. One is I've asked some professional gun makers. They say, yeah, it takes 40 hours to polish, polish a gun. Uh, the other is when I did the uh, 1912 style Centennial Colt for DIY a few years ago, I talked to Doug Turnbull and figured out what grit I needed to polish that gun to before I sent it to him for bluing. And the answer was around 3000. And so <laughs> for the course of 40 hours, I wore my fingertips out polishing this gun to the appropriate level of polish that it would have looked like in 1912. And this is what they all looked like back then. But the thing is, that was something that I could do over the course or a number of days, taking my sweet time, just very slowly, very carefully under a magnified visor, making those passes with the various grits until I got where I wanted to go. And there is that moment, which is reflecting that image, which is really exciting when you can first start to see yourself in the work. But you can't reasonably yeah. charge somebody any appropriate amount for 40 hours of hand polishing and expect to produce guns on a serial basis. So Colt has to do that faster. And the ability to do that slowly over 40 hours, that's one thing, and that's tough. But the guys at Colt walk up to a spinning wheel, hold that slide in their hand, pass it across that wheel until they have it flawless, then go to the next grip. And that's a far different level of skill to be able to do that power tool, keep your flat flat, your rounds around workspace the guy yeah i i think um <clears throat> just uh, what you're describing is doing that by you know on an actual wheel you're using when you're hand polishing do you when you did the 1912 for example did you use a block for the flats to make sure that you didn't lose any flat so to speak i I either used blocks, I used files, I used uh, oak dowels for some of the rounds. You definitely can't just hold the paper loose in your hand. You'll get ripples doing that. Right, which will show. And and people don't realize that. I mean, yes, <laughs> we often wonder why a, a beautiful 1911 can cost thousands of dollars. Well, there's one reason right there. Uh, when you're talking dozens of hours of hand labor by an incredibly skilled gunsmith, uh, uh, there you have it. And you know, it's like engraving. If you've seen really, really good stuff, the bad stuff jumps out at you. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, What's I'm interesting. In polishing a Colt. I... Oh, go ahead. go ahead. I mentioned the polishing a Colt, and you've got that the sign up there in the image. In 2011, I had kind of the trifecta of what you would want to do in the centennial of the 1911. I got to go to Novax, Colt, and Gunsight all in about 10 days. And in my trip to Colt, I got to spend a couple of days in the custom shop um, watching them prepare to engrave a gun that I had sent up mm -hmm. there and got to go through the polishing area. And I was really surprised that they actually do have a sign hanging from the ceiling to honor the polishers. And I understand exactly why now. That's not something you see in every factory. <laughs> I've, I've toured quite a few myself and uh, this is a first right here, you know, the, the finishing department. So you, you, you shared something in, uh, in the article itself, a little sneak preview for those who haven't gotten the magazine yet. Um, you know, about um, uh, the old Colts back in 1912, how the ordinance office kind of, well, can I say complained to Colt and said, Hey, you know, yes, you got to tone down the shine on these things uh, before somebody gets killed. <laughs> <laughs> and you know uh to which they they responded uh well i just believe we can provide a more dull finish you know <laughs> gotta love the gotta love the attitude uh, it was more clinical language it was probably a lot like that's really pretty stop it somebody's gonna die <laughs> okay <laughs> well you just you just don't see that anymore i tell you i've got a uh an old colt woodsman uh, this one was a series one made in 1936 and it is just, it's just polished. It is finished beautifully. I mean, there's not a mark scratch ripple, nothing. It's, you know, it's glass, like it's a blued finish, but it is a glass like finish. It's just absolutely incredible what they, what they do to those guns. I've got an old Colt officers model match 38, uh, 38 special. That was a gift from a deer friend and same thing you look at it and it was every other gun off the production line in the 1950s but boy it's gorgeous and we just don't see a lot of that anymore 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, that's, uh, this has been, you know, interesting hearing a little bit of a backstory about the gun itself. Uh, anything else that stood out to you about this particular gun that you want to share with our viewers and readers? I liked the classic lines. It's got a spur hammer. It's got a tab thumb safety on it. It's not, not a, not one of our, you know, what we usually expect of a hot rod fighting gun. It's a classic 1911 in every sense of the word. And I think the polish just really shows off the lines well. And it, with grips like that, they need to be on a special gun. But if the gun's too busy, you're just going to kind of lose everything and you're going to overdo mm -hmm. it a little bit. And so I thought plain but pretty was the way to go. You know what? That's an interesting point. I was looking at this one, I think uh, if you went with something engraved or whatever, it would it would be too much. I think it would take away from the the focus on the grips, which is really the special part of of uh, this one. That's what I thought too. It lets it lets each of the it lets each component, the gun and the grip, show their best advantage. Well, fantastic. Well, thanks for for sharing your thoughts with this. Um, uh, remember, everybody, you can you can see this in the November December issue of American Handgunner Magazine. Current issue is out now. Um, Jeremy's got something in well, most most issues that uh, we put out. I know you've got a <clears throat> list of things that you're working on for forthcoming issues. What's uh, what's next in the queue that we're going to see from you in Handgunner? Probably the next on the pipeline and completely on the opposite end of the 1911 spectrum is Cabot's 2011 style 9mm 1911 with a dot, which I'm currently shooting. As you expect from a Cabot, it's got a brilliant trigger. It's shockingly accurate. It's unbelievably controllable. Uh, it's the sort of thing that you'd expect from a, a company with their reputation. And on the, the long term side, I was informed couple of years ago by a dear friend that Jesus didn't love me if I didn't love the 44 special. I know how it <laughs> feels about it was coming before the 44 special, so that's coming. <laughs> nice. I'm looking forward to that one. Although I do have to wonder how you get your hands on all these gorgeous, very expensive firearms. So we'll, uh, we'll save that talk for another day, <laughs> but I'm glad you do. Drive very expensive car. <laughs> most of the time <laughs> nice all right well thanks again for joining us today um if y'all want more content like this see more insiders hit that like button hit the subscribe button to subscribe to the fmg pubs channel on youtube or you can find us on any of your favorite podcast networks without with that said we are out until next time we'll see you later thank you sir <laughs>